أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله أما بعد All praise is due to Allah and may his peace and blessings be upon our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam I begin by greeting my brothers and sisters saying Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Speaking of human rights Before we go into what are the rights of humans I really do not think that is the issue. The issue is not what are the rights of humans. The issue is who humans are. Because many times we tend to be speaking of rights, but we're talking about certain kind of people are entitled to these rights. And in reality, we are not addressing the mere issue of who these humans are. Let me give you an example. I remember one time in the Washington Post, a local newspaper in the, um, in the States. On the third page of the Washington Post, it was uh, said that 35 dogs died in Texas when they ate poisoned food. 35 dogs died because they ate poisoned food. On page six, it was reported that a thousand Nigerians died when an oil pipe exploded. Now, wait a minute. You mean to tell me that 35 dogs dying is reported on page three? And you mean to tell me that a thousand Africans died is reported on page six? We're talking about human life, intensity, number, impact, but yet our problem has always been, or I think is who humans are. See my brothers and sisters, the Quran, when it addresses the issue of justice, this is what it emphasizes, that remember, you are dealing with another human being. See, many times we can be aware of the rights and we can be aware of what these people are entitled to. But what we do in the process is that we dehumanize them. Not that we take away the rights, but we feel that they are not entitled to these rights at this point. Be it to the fact that we love or we hate or we are angry or what have you, as inshallah we will see in some of these examples. Very quickly, the other day, I was talking about how, um, what kind of importance does Islam give to the concept of justice. And we said that we can see five verses in the Quran, how Allah speaks of this concept. And the point for it is that the protection of human rights. Number one, Allah says, Shahid Allahu annahu la ilaha illa huwa wal malaikatu wa ulul ilmi qa'iman bil qist. So that Allah bears witness that no one is worthy of worship but Allah. And the angels bear witness. And those who possess knowledge, they bear witness that Allah stands firmly for justice. So number one, we are taught in the Quran that it is one of the attributes of Allah. You ask how just Allah is, and we know the verse that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not consider us by the color of our skin or our social status or any of that or the fact that we are male or female. That is all irrelevant. Rather, Allah judges us according to our deeds and according to our actions. That is justice. You look again and the second verse that explains the importance of justice in the Quran is where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we have sent our messengers with clear signs and we gave them the scripture, the book. Why? So that men may uphold justice. What the verse tells us is why Isa, Jesus was sent, Moses was sent, um, Muhammad وسلم, Ibrahim وسلم, all these prophets, they came for what? So that people may uphold justice. And we also look into the Quran and again, and we see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna Allah ya'muru bil adli wal ihsan. Allah commands people of justice and righteousness. Now wait a minute. Righteousness is superior. Ihsan, it is the highest form of iman. Yet Allah mentions justice before he mentions ihsan. To tell us the importance of this concept of justice, that this is what the messengers were sent for and also remember no matter how you feel about the other person no matter how good of a person you are you always give justice and then the next two verses allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says he said oh you who believe stand as witnesses for allah or be as witnesses for allah standing firmly for justice be it against your own self 
or against your own parents or your kins. The other verse says, O oh, ye who believe, stand firmly for justice as witnesses for Allah and do not let your hatred of other people swerve you from justice. Be just for that is where piety is. See, anyone can be just. Most people can be fair in normal circumstances. But we are truly tested. We are truly tested when you've got these emotions of either a lot of love or extreme hate. That is when the whole concept of justice is needed most. And that is why we have to be just under all circumstances. However, we may know it in theory, but if we do not act upon it, if we keep demanding and not wanting to fulfill our obligations, our religion becomes nothing but philosophy. Good principles to live by or actually to think about whether you implement it or you do not is not important. And that is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لُعِنَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا مِنْ بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلِ Some of the people of Bani Israel, the children of Israel, were cursed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because of the wrongdoing that they did. And then Allah says, كَانُوا لَا يَتَنَاهَوْنَ عَمْ مُنْكَرٍ فَعَلُونَ And they never forbade one another. They saw injustice going on. They saw wickedness going on. But what happened is that although they all saw it, but no one did anything about it. The culture of silence. And also the Prophet ﷺ gives a beautiful example. And he says that the people who see wrong and do not do anything about it is like a group of people that embarked a ship somewhere on the upper deck of the ship and others were on the lower deck of the ship. And every time the people from the lower deck needed water, what they did is that they came up to the upper deck and they got the water and they went back in again. And somehow they felt that they were inconveniencing the people that were on the upper deck. So what happened is that they thought to themselves, the Prophet ﷺ said, they said, you know, every time we need the water, what we're doing is that we are getting up on the upper deck, be bringing discomfort to the people who are on the upper deck. It will be easier if we were to just make a hole where we are at the very bottom of the ship. So this way, the water is going to come up. But what happens if that happens? What the Prophet ﷺ said, if they let them do this, even though the intention is good, said if they let them do this, everyone is going to sink. However, if people see it and they stop them, everyone is going to be saved. So my brothers, it is not important, more important than fighting for justice is that we ourselves be just. More important than fighting for equality is that we ourselves be fair. So Islam does not accept any form of passivity when it comes to the whole concept of justice. It must be served and it must be served all the time. And remember, no matter what happens, humans do not lose their integrity and dignity. No matter how wicked they may become, every single person always possesses their human dignity and integrity. And again, remember, what we do in the process is that it is not their rights that we forget, it is the fact that they are humans that we forget. Let me give you some of these examples, and they will be in the form of stories. And I apologize, some of them, by the way, most of these stories, if not all, are true stories. But in the process, they tell us how we dehumanize other people. Reviewing the second rule of al mim al sakina That is the letter Meem. So if the first Meem is non-vowel or sakina, followed by a voweled Meem. So I will merge the first in the letter and I will pronounce them as one. And we spoke abundantly on the virtues of seek a refuge with Allah from the outcast Satan. Especially for the first reciter, he's got to recite it out loud. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم فإذا جاءت الصاخة وإذا النجوم
Make sure it's Dhamma wa idannu wa idannu fusu. Thank you for joining us. One time, it was said that uh, a man was wrongly imprisoned for three years. And when he came out of prison, his wife was pregnant. So he was not able to see his, his family for three years. So he had a son that he has not seen. So on the day that he was freed from prison, you can just see the hugs and the kisses and the tears of happiness that were going on at that place. You know, the husband hugging his wife, hugging his child, and just crying out of happiness, out of joy that he is finally reunited with his family. So the mother is a bit busy on this side, and the son is talking to his father, and he is, as, as he is talking, he calls him, Sir. So the father looks at him and he says, Don't call me, sir. I am your daddy, call me daddy. So the son looks at him and goes, No, you are not daddy. Daddy is the man that sleeps with mommy every day. Now, to add insult to injury, there is nothing worse than this. Now that you are wrongly imprisoned, and on top of that, you find out that your family was not faithful to you. So immediately, his face changes. And as they are driving back home, his wife is talking to him. But he's no longer the sweet loving husband that he was a few minutes ago. And she does not know why. But she explains to herself, you know, probably it's because the jail time that he had to do. I mean, that we're talking about more than a thousand days. They changed a man. His face changed. He's got all gray hair all over. He lost weight. He's really changed. So they go home. And she's talking to her husband, reminding him, do you remember what we said when we made that vow? If Allah ever frees you from prison, we are going to make, you know, Hajj, or we're going to make Umrah. And the husband blasts back as his wife, and he says, you're not even pure enough to go to the house of Allah. And now she doesn't understand what he's talking about. And in the midst of anger, what does he do? He pushes her down the stairs. And she falls down the stairs, she goes all the way down. 20 steps, she's going down. In the meantime, the son is coming to his father and he's showing him a picture and he said, see, here is daddy. The husband takes the picture and it is his picture three years ago. He said, what are you talking about? He said, every night I come to mom and I say, mom, can I please sleep with you? Mom will say, no, you cannot sleep with me. I am going to sleep with daddy and she holds the picture. He runs downstairs to see what happened to the wife. She broke her spinal cord, became quadriplegic, paralyzed from the neck down. Now tell me how many times can you say you're sorry? Tell me how many times can you say I did not mean it? Tell me how many times can you say I wish I asked, I wish I did. But see the question is this, Islam says even when you get information about other human being, make sure that you verify it. Do not let your words of assumptions kick in. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, in jaakum fasiqum binaba'in, fatabayyanu, an tusibu qawman bi jahala, fatusbihu ala ma fa'altum nadimeen. O ye who believe, whenever you receive information, verify it, so that you may not harm other people and bear the ill consequences of what you do. But again, in the process, we forget that we are dealing with human beings. Not only that, but we tend to be very selective as to what kind of human beings we like to love and get along with. One time it was said that a man, a young man was in the, was in the army. So after a few years, his family never heard from him. He calls home and he says, Dad, I am on my way home. And the father is very excited. The mother is very excited and they're all waiting for that day. You know, we're so happy that you are coming back. And then he asks them, Dad, can I bring a friend with me? He was, you know, in the, in the battlefield with me. I'd like to bring him with me. They said, of course, no problem. And then he said, but there is only one problem with him. We were walking one day and a mine, a landmine, exploded 
and he lost a leg and he lost an arm and he lost one of his eyes. So they said, no problem, just have him come in. And he said, you know, mom, actually I'm not bringing him in. I like him to live with us. So the father said, you know, or the mother said, son, we're talking about someone that is severely handicapped here. We cannot, it will be a lot of responsibility, just great inconveniency, you know, to have someone like this in our house. And as they are talking, they find out that someone has hung up the phone or he's no longer on the other line. And they are screaming, hello, hello. No one gets anything. Few days after, they receive a phone call from the police. And they say, we have a body here and we believe it is your son's body. And we like you to come and identify the body. You know, all saddened, they go there to identify the body. And they said, you know, we do not think that he, was, he, he died out of natural causes. We believe that it was a suicide. So they go in to identify the body, and here's what they find. Their son lost a leg, he lost an arm, and he also lost one of his eyes. What happens is that we feel that our love or acceptance of other human beings is very conditional. So long that they do not cause any inconveniency in our lives, we are going to take them. The more good looking they are, the better social status that they have, you know, the less inconvenience they cause us, that is when we are getting them. In reality, a person does not lose his, his integrity or his dignity because of his circumstances. One time, this speaker was invited to give a motivational speech. So what he did is that he took $100 from his pocket. And he said, who would like to have this $100? So they all, you know, all the people that were attending, they all raised their hands. We want $100. So I said, okay, one condition. He takes the $100 and he really crumbles it very bad. And he says, now, who wants this $100? And all the people that raised their hands earlier, they all raised their hands again. He goes, one more thing. He throws it down on the ground and he really, really steps on it and he picks it up again and he says, now, who still wants this $100? They all raise their hand again, they all want the $100. He takes the $100 and he spits on it. And he says, now, who wants the $100? Again, they all raised their hands for the $100. And then he says, ladies and gentlemen, I rest my case. You just learned a great lesson on value. You all knew that the crumbled $100 was still worth $100. When I threw it on the ground and I stepped on it, it was still worth $100. When I spit on it, it was still worth $100. Human beings are like that. No matter what circumstances are, no matter what difficult times they're going through, no matter how much they have failed, no matter how crumbled they may be, no matter how many people have stepped on them, they do not lose their value. No one loses their value, my brothers and sisters. No matter how poor you are, beginning with you, you should never allow anyone to degrade you because of your circumstances. Equally as important, you do not degrade and rip people of their human dignity and integrity because of the situations that they are in. No matter what they are guilty of. And that is why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he was presented with a man that was drinking alcohol all the time and people started cursing him, he said, do not curse him. He loves Allah and his messenger. Now this is an alcoholic and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is saying, look, this alcoholic person loves Allah and his messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Meaning that I may be guilty of it. But guess what? It does not reduce my human dignity and integrity no matter what happens. And every time you deal with any other person, make sure my brothers and sisters that we recognize the difference between these two things, between the person and between the performance. We can criticize the performance. Definitely was an evil deed. It's a terrible deed. It was a bad deed, but the person himself does not lose his human dignity and integrity 
even if he is a kafir. That's what was said earlier. وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي آدَمُ The children of Adam were all honored by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when we say this, wallahi, it is not for the sake of political correctness or for the sake of sounding good or for the fact that we have non-Muslim in the audience. That is irrelevant. We are relaying the teachings of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We are talking about what Islam is saying and what Islam emphasizes is not the human rights, although it was greatly addressed. It was the fact that remember that they are humans no matter what. No matter what, they are humans. And that is why again, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, and you hear this, you know, all the time here. And that is a person, you know, you have your child walking around, break something and you start cursing them or you start yelling them or giving them names or and the Prophet said look he said your household items have an appointed term the same way that you have an appointed term so do not curse your children and you hear again people stripping other people from their human dignity and integrity no matter what happens and islam absolutely refuses this position my brothers and sisters and that is why again islam says that it is not enough that you, you cannot be passive i quoted desmond tutu when he said in a situation of injustice if you decide to be neutral then you have chosen the side of the oppressor and that is not an acceptable islamic position do something about it was said that a king one time he wanted to, st to test his fellow citizens so what he did is that he placed this big rock on the way on the path of people and he hid behind another rock to see how the people were going to react it was very clear that that piece of a rock was an inconvenience to whoever passes by that road so he saw some of his ministers they came they saw the rock, they walked around it, and they kept going. Nothing. So then other people came, they looked around, they saw the rock, they walked around it, and kept going. A peasant comes, and he was carrying his belongings, and when he saw the rock, he put his belongings down, and he starts pushing the rock outside of the path of people. And it was a big rock and he struggled with it. He struggled with it and he struggled and finally he was able to push it. And the minute he pushed it away, there was a purse there with a lot of gold in it. And there was a letter from the king. And this is a gift to he who removes this from the path of people. Now this is what the king said or did. But 1400 years ago, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam told us this, that a man was walking on the road and when he saw a big uh, branch, of a tree that was an inconvenience to people. So he said to himself, let me remove this from the path of the Muslims and he threw it out of the way. Allah forgave his sins and Allah admitted him to paradise. It may be as little as this, but the idea that Islam always emphasizes that as a Muslim you have a contribution to make to humanity. And the biggest contribution that you can make is respecting their human dignity and integrity all the time and positively, positively contributing to the elimination of injustice and the bringing of justice. We cannot be passive, my brothers and sisters. We can talk about the rights. We can say, yes, you have the right to own, you have the right to do this. But what happens if there is no one to speak on behalf of these oppressed people? We're giving the example yesterday about the divorcees, about the widows, about the AIDS patients. What about the handicapped people? Handicapped people. Have you seen the way they are treated in our societies, in our communities? And I say this to our, in our Muslim communities and societies. How they are devalued, how they are not paid attention to.